speaking. Um, great. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I started off my career in urban real estate development in 1999, focused on how to bring people back into urban centers by reinvesting in them, cleaning them up, and creating mixed income, equitable, and diverse communities. I thought that if we reversed urban sprawl and restored cohesive urban communities, we could solve a whole spectrum of problems and issues that we were facing in society, including environmental problems. Over time, however, I saw firsthand that the belief that nature is out there, it's outside of cities and suburbs where we are, and the associated belief that wherever we are, whether it's indoors or outdoors, we have the right to replace nature with our own architectural designs, artistry, and fanciful visions of what we like and what makes us happy that these beliefs were causing us to destroy larger and larger swaths of natural land for cities across the country. And this continued even as urban centers have revived and people have moved back to them. Just this February, let me just, oops, let me sorry, get back. Just this February, a brand new report by the United Nations made the point that I started to realize about 10 years ago, that we must learn to reconcile the way we live, where we are, wherever we are, with natural systems, if either is to survive. The report is called Making Peace with Nature, and it contains urgent messages about the many human systems that need to change in order for us to have a future on Earth. It's some pretty heady stuff. But I want to read out loud one of the key messages set out at the front of the report. Everyone, everyone has a role to play in ensuring that human knowledge, ingenuity, technology, and cooperation are redeployed from transforming nature to transforming humankind's relationship with nature. Land use, how we use our land, is a major driver of climate change, biodiversity loss, stormwater and flood management, and many other problems. And land use needs to be at the heart of our transformation. So I founded Urban Ecosystem Restorations, or UER, in 2014 to help people engage in this process. UER is a nonprofit urban land trust that works primarily across the DC metro region to create, protect, and aggregate what we call eco functioning spaces. As part of that effort, we also work to engage key stakeholders in every part of the process, particularly the protection part, which includes maintenance and respectful use of the spaces. Today, I'm going to talk about what eco functioning spaces are, why we need them in the urban space, and how they relate to ecosystem health. So today, um, for our agenda, I want to empower you with the knowledge and resources to both understand and explain to your friends and neighbors the problem, first the problem with business as usual, or continuing to promote the behaviors that we've used for the past 50 to 100 years in urban and suburban areas. What healthy ecosystems are, why they matter, and the connection between your yard and ecosystem health looking at both the local and regional level. Third, how to use your yard to heal your local ecosystem. Fourth, how to avoid what I call the whack-a-mole problem. And fifth, the roles we need the public sector and the private sector to take. Now, we may not get through everything today because I know time is tight and people need to leave early. So how far I get will partly depend on what people want to talk about. Um, but let me get started. So I want to place us all in context. I love this image from Disney's film Moana. It profoundly captures how I think nature must feel about us right now. And here we are, boiling away. Many of us still think we're relaxing in a hot tub, but we are in serious danger 
We're not want where we want to be on any global environmental measure if we want to survive and thrive as a species in the coming decades. Today, we're going to talk about how to wake up, jump out of this pot of boiling water, and scale up new directions, directions that partner with nature for all of our benefit. So here's what business as usual has produced, and this is just the beginning. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the problems with continuing to do what we've been doing. We could be here all day talking about the breakdown of ecological systems around the world and in our urban regions. I'm just gonna cover some basic points here. To bring us down from the global to a more local example here, I'm gonna use Maryland. This graphic shows urban expansion through 2010, only through 2010. Suburban development, which has continued largely unabated since 1973, has left compacted soils, pavement, turf grass, and invasive species in place of functioning ecosystems and native habitat. These patterns are substantially similar for most growing East Coast cities, and they certainly apply in Florida. So for at least 50 years, this growth in development has been weakening and really dismantling natural systems across larger and larger swaths of basically every state. A process that has contributed to species extinctions, climate change, air pollution, and major flooding, among many other problems. Most of us live in urban areas that nature can no longer sustain. UER created this GIS map of the Maryland suburbs of Washington, DC a few years ago with 2014 data, just to get a sense of how local ecosystems are functioning in and across urban areas. We used water quality, land cover, like impervious surface and air quality as rough measures of how well nature's doing despite human disturbances to the environment. Darker shades reflect higher levels of degradation, but failures were observed across the board. Ruth Ellen, if you have a question um, that's urgent, do you want to type it in the chat? That was from before. Oh, okay, okay. You, you can unraise your hand, um, okay. The two messages from this map are first, intact and protected natural areas that are outside of the urban space are either too degraded too small or too far away to perform on these indicators in urban areas. And second, the nature that remains in the urban space, often called urban green space, is not performing on these indicators. With the expansion of business as usual development, problems like poor air and water quality will only get worse and nature's ability to function anywhere at all will continue to weaken. So here, I'm just gonna, oops, sorry. Excuse me. So as you can see, this quote talks about one of the most formidable threats to earth species is our, our way of building out land, which is through habitat loss, degradation and fragmentation. As populations have grown, so have cities, suburbs, industrial areas, and agricultural lands, all of which are disrupting or displacing natural ecosystems that were once there. We know that restoring nature in human-centric landscapes like urban areas is one of, if not the most important of the solutions to our global and local environmental problems. Once we accept that premise, then we have to figure out how to grow demographically, economically, and spatially, while restoring nature and expanding its footprint. So I'm here to talk about how we stop degrading and start restoring natural areas into growing urban areas, and how we do it in a way that yields real environmental returns on investment. Yeah, sorry. So let's just talk about ecosystems what they are, what makes an ecosystem healthy, and why that matters. So starting with some terms. 
First, let me just say, when I use the term urban, I'm talking about metropolitan statistical areas. That means not just urban core cities, but inner and outer suburbs. When I use the term nature, I'm talking about indigenous ecosystems. Ecosystems are what we need to restore when we talk about restoring nature. At the simplest level, ecosystems are communities of interacting organisms and their environments that have co-evolved in a location for hundreds of years. Looking more closely at what an ecosystem is, we see tremendous complexity. Every ecosystem consists of individuals, populations, and numerous cycles and subsystems. Every piece of land is part of a larger ecosystem. So, for example, there are land, air, and water connections that govern, say, the movement of water over your neighborhood's land and back to the sea. There are a mix of native plant species that have a history of coexisting in communities together. They actually help each other within their communities alongside animals that have evolved to live in those plant communities, all of which process matter and energy through the system. Recently, Doug Tallamy and other scientists have discovered the special role of keystone plant species, native plant species, that can support huge numbers of animals within these systems, more than many other plant species combined. Just like our bodies, from our cells to our organs, to our nervous system, circulatory system, digestive system, to name a few, they're all performing their own particular functions, all while interacting with each other and working together to make the body work as a whole. These populations, cycles, and subsystems have developed ways of interacting with each other that create a level of balance and predictability. They're not static, they're interact but their interactions have evolved over long periods of time, and they provide structure and integrity to an ecosystem. These historic interactions all contribute to the healthy function of an ecosystem in which they're located. They also produce the global environment in which humans have evolved and thrived for thousands of years. Damaging or destroying these relationships can destroy the system entirely. The point here is that restoring and preserving the established interactions of living things and system cycles is at the core of what we need to do to restore nature. And every yard plays a role that either strengthens these interactions or weakens them. So one thing to be aware of is that ecosystems are spatial units and they occur at all different sizes and scales. And they're usually embedded within larger ecosystems. In the urban space, ecosystems can occur as forests, meadows, rivers, and wetlands but they often look different to what we might expect. In the urban space, we find small scale ecosystems, component parts of ecosystems, and partially engineered ecosystems. Ecosystem boundaries are often not well defined and fragments often function both as their own system and as part of a larger ecosystem. So as previously mentioned, your yard fits into this fabric. Okay, so what? Why do we care about any of this? Well, you might care about the majestic beauty and fabulous intricacies of nature, but let's say you don't. Let's get down to brass tacks. As healthy ecosystems function, they produce a wide range of ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are defined in a variety of ways, but for this talk, I'm gonna focus on what's called regulating services, like outdoor temperature regulation, managing heat islands, air filtration, meaning clean air, water filtration, clean water, water cycling, flood management, carbon absorption and sequestration, nutrient cycling, and the maintenance of food webs necessary for food production. These are essential for urban societies to operate on a daily basis. We rely on numerous other ecosystem services, but the regulating services are need-to-haves 
that when people try to perform them without nature's help, they are costly and require intensive inputs of energy and resources if we can perform them at all. Just as an aside, I'll mention human health here as an ecosystem service as well, even though it's not considered a regulating service, but it's increasingly discussed as an ecosystem service and is arguably fairly important. So it's also something I consider as we go through. Um, I wanna note here that some ecosystem services occur only inside of or within close proximity to the ecosystem itself. So while other services can benefit entire regions or even the planet. So an example of ecosystem services that one can only experience or that provide substantially greater benefits locally are air filtration, health and wellness, heat island reduction and outdoor temperature controls, and stormwater management and flood management. One example is that particulate matter which is air pollution that can cause asthma and other, other, um, other breathing problems. Um, most of the air filtration that say a given tree performs occurs within 100 feet of that tree. And for mental health <clears throat> and stress reduction benefits, research is showing that proximity and frequent exposure to nature deliver the greatest medical benefits. <clears throat> okay, so I want to take you through a little thought experiment that this slide is not perfect for, but I want you to flow with me. <laughs> so the first thought experiment is that these men <clears throat> are elephant doctors. And instead of associating pieces of the elephant with random objects, they're treating this elephant's wounds. Imagine that each elephant doctor is a specialist who can only heal the part of the elephant he's touching. Let's say it's a bleeding trunk, a broken foot, a ripped ear. Now imagine that all of these ailments have occurred because the elephant has been starved and beaten for years. In fact, the elephant is so weak, its heart is about to give out. Are these doctors focused on the right actions? I want you to put in the chat what you think about my question. Are these doctors focused on the right thing? <clears throat> Let's see, I don't see anybody yet. <clears throat> Okay, so we're getting we're getting some consensus, <clears throat> which is great. Um, hopefully, I haven't I haven't uh, steered you too hard. But let's just take this into uh, a, a, a modification of that thought experiment. Imagine the elephant is your regional ecosystem, and each man here is fighting for a valuable ecosystem service that flows from that ecosystem. So. One of the men is fighting to keep clean water. <clears throat> Another one's fighting for monarch butterflies and pollinators. Another's fighting to fix imbalances of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Imagine that each of these men is fighting hard to fix one symptom of a larger, symptoms, a larger system breakdown. If the system stops running, all the policies and the money in the world will not keep the benefits that we want and need flowing. It's a little like killing the goose that lays the golden eggs, but somehow expecting those golden eggs to continue to appear through our powers of technology and innovation. So I keep talking about ecosystem health and how healthy ecosystems reduce ecosystem services. What is a healthy ecosystem? So a healthy ecosystem is one that's functioning well with all of its subsystems working and interacting with each other in a roughly balanced fashion, consistent with the norms of evolution. But how do we know if this is happening? Um, there are certain key attributes that cause an ecosystem to function well, and they're useful indicators of ecosystem health. So, um, 
they include biological genetic and interaction diversity, meaning how often and productively do different species interact with each other. Structural diversity, which we're, we're going to talk about in a sec, and the regular cycling of, of different materials and energy through the system, including nutrients and water. These drivers create regulatory processes, regulating processes that maintain that rough balance and ensure the system is strong enough to return to normal after a shock or disturbance. In addition, ecosystems need to be of sufficient size to serve the populations that rely on them. And in today's world, we increasingly need to connect intact ecosystems to one another. So, Here's, a, here's a, a spectrum of ecosystem health from left to right, with the healthiest at the left, the least healthy at the right. In these images, let's take a look at biodiversity, structural diversity, and cycling of energy materials. So here's the healthy picture. In healthy ecosystem, you see diverse forms of plant life, native plant life. Um, and though we don't see all the animal life in this photo, we know what's happening above and below ground you see a highly ver highly varied vertical structure. So that means that plant species are occupying different niches um, within the ecosystem. Forests, mature forests traditionally have four to five layers depending on how you count them, um, which we could talk about in more detail if you're interested. And then you see plants of all ages growing at different heights. So you get this variety of plants at different vertical heights. Um, they are, uh, the, the, the very tree ages show us that life cycle population succession is occurring. That means that when an old tree dies, it's sad, maybe it's sad, but it's not a crisis because there are all these young trees coming up after it. Whereas when you see the one tree in the big grassy field, when that tree's gone, it's all gone. There's no community left. There's no system left. Um, diverse native plants support a, a robust food web. You may, if you've seen the Doug Tallamy video, you know that many, many animals, especially at the lower, what's called trophic levels, are specialists. That means that insects often require specific plants. They have a relationship with specific plants. And if you don't have those plants, you don't have those insects. If you don't have those insects, you don't have the birds and higher predators that feed on them. And you start breaking down a food web system. So here we've got a resilient, a resilient ecosystem. You can see the, you know, vertical structures filled in. There's what's called refuge for animals and plants, which helps them survive threats, so on and so forth. Let's, let's take a look at these three pictures. Um, so from the left side, you have the least degraded, but it's, um, it's a narrow linear strip of forest fragment along a road. It has reduced vertical structure, a certain limited amount of biodiversity, which is partly because it's surrounded by non-native grasses and pavements. It's suffering erosion due to gray stormwater management infrastructure. And invasive plants and deer browse are starting to reduce natural succession. The middle one shows removal of all structural diversity. Few signs of biodiversity or plant diversity, minimal system dynamics, and a predominance of non-native plants in Maryland and most of the East Coast, um, grass is not native. Uh, it doesn't feed anything. It doesn't support, for the most part, any cycles. Um, it's kind of a green carpet that does very little for the environment. And then on the, on the right side, you see that pavement has largely destroyed any possibility of ecosystem cycling. Uh, you've got a few remnant trees that are largely, they're surviving, but they're largely infested by invasive species. I call the middle picture here, the one with the trees in their underwear, just because they look so naked. And whenever I see trees like this, I have the urge to clothe them. Um, but that's just, that's just me. So natural restoration is about returning structure returning the drivers of um, returning the drivers of ecosystem health back 
into our natural space, our green space, and even our paved space. So let me just, um, I just want to pause here for a minute and see, well, actually, we'll, we can, um, I'll show you this slide here, uh, because biodiversity is a driver. Many people don't see our loss of biodiversity. Um, they think there are plenty of animals around, but we are suffering through some very severe mass extinctions that are happening right now. Um, um, and so let me just, does anybody have anything? Yeah, grass is almost like putting pavement down. It does not feed anything. Um, mo so to get to some specific plant recommendations, mul mulching is a complicated issue. <laughs> and um, we're gonna, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it as we move on. It sounds like maybe people are interested in getting kind of down into the specifics of the house. So let me move along. Just quickly at the, when you think about the regional level, um, there's sort of three components. There's um, the, the quality of the land, uh, the quality of sort of the, the ecosystem ha and habitat or, or vegetation that you're creating, which we've just been talking about uh, in terms of biodiversity, structural complexity, cycling of matter and energy. In the regional context, it's that's where you're really looking at quantity are you you know how many people will sort of convert their yard so that we can stitch those yards together and create large space um as addition as it as well as some of the the larger sort of intact properties that function have ecosystem function connectivity is something i just want to spend a second on um, right now, because at the regional level, this is so important and it's so important to understand this and how your yards play a role. So let me just talk about connectivity. Um, because urban growth is fragmenting formerly intact regional ecosystems so tremendously, that means and and one thing you may or may not have gotten out of Doug Tallamy's video or work is that as you make intact ecosystems more and more of an island as you consolidate that space into um into sort of too small of a space for the populations that require them you you wind up reducing both genetic diversity as, as well as overall plant species as well as overall plant and animal sp species and one of the ways you can help solve some of the problems of having done that is by connecting those intact areas with ecologically functioning space. And so the more we're able to do that, um, the better off the better off those intact spaces are, the healthier they wind up being. So um, as component ecosystems of all size become better connected and able to work together as a whole system, they become better at managing extreme storms, ensuring strong food webs and cleaning the air, among other things. And that leaves each of us better off. So you, you get your localized benefit, and then you also are benefiting the regional level as, as you expand sort of what I think of as yard conversions or land conversions. Um, and I want to note that the connections don't have to be entirely contiguous, although that's helpful. So there are lands that can work as functional connectors or way stations for animals that can find their way from one safe place to the next. And every urban space can do this and should as long as, as long as it's not attracting animals to places where they're likely to die or be killed. Um, so you don't necessarily want to attract animals into the middle of a city center that's surrounded by, um, you know, networks of highways where, where the one place those animals want to go is is the middle of five freeways. Um, but setting that aside, otherwise you can create way stations for animals, especially migrating animals. 
Okay, so let's talk about your yard specifically. We know that business as usual land uses and land covers have few, if any, drivers of healthy ecosystem function. By now we know that turf grass is not green and asphalt does not cycle nutrients or feed local animal populations. Here's the great news though. Cities and suburbs don't have to be this way. Suburban yards do not have to be characterized by compacted, degraded soils devoid of native habitat and biodiversity. Rather, we can make every square foot count using what UER calls eco-functioning spaces. These landscapes work to solve multiple environmental problems by restoring ecosystem interactions. You can not only manage stormwater and support biodiversity in your yard, you can reduce heat islands, address climate change, and improve your local air, local air and water quality, all by restoring habitat using native trees, shrubs, and perennials. By doing so, you support your regional ecosystems, you're adding total land area and building connectivity at the regional level. Um, it looks like somebody has their hand raised. Do you want to um, unmute? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, well, feel free to put along the chat um, if you have a question. Sorry. Okay. So here's, here's a conceptual vision of how eco-functioning spaces work. We, first, we start with three fundamental guides, air, water, and land. We ask, how do we maximize ecosystem function and services for air, for example? How do we use vegetation, native vegetation, for air filtration, managing air temperature, absorbing carbon? For water, how do we use native vegetation to improve our soils? Um, the topography to capture and infiltrate stormwater and which, which as you infiltrate the stormwater down into the ground, you recharge your subsurface water flows. And for land, how do we use native plant communities to mimic or recreate native habitat and attract biodiversity? Um, and then the fourth category for us is how do we bring in the human element and engage people with that space in a way that respects the first three categories. Oops. So, so once, once you bring those elements together and you allow for the relationships to start to reweave themselves, that's when the fun starts and the systems engine starts to turn. So native plants develop deep or expansive root systems and they leave naturally organic matter in the soils both of which then restore the porosity of the soils and return microbial activity below the ground, which also improves water management and, uh, and flood management. Then as the plants grow, they're absorbing and sequestering carbon, both above and below ground, especially the woody plants, which we, we can talk specifically about, um, while nourishing the soils. As the food webs take shape, you get biological and predatory controls to manage insect populations, insect and rodent populations. So you may have harmless snakes around that control your mice, and you may have birds that are controlling your, your um, pests and mosquitoes. Uh, so, and then we reduce emissions as we, and we save effort by creating no mow and no blow landscapes is what we call them. Normally, we call them the mow, blow, and go guys. Those are the guys who mow your yard, blow off all the leaves, and leave. Um, we need the no mow and no blow kinds of landscapes where you start to restore the ecosystems, which don't, which every waste product of one process is the input of energy for another process. Um, and we can we can talk more specifically about that as well, but it's sort of this beautiful, amazing intricacy of ecosystems. Um, so as you design the space to increase system interactions and integrity um, and avoid unnecessary or toxic inputs like pesticides and chemicals, um, we not only get the system running, but we get it growing and strengthening. 
As the system strengthens, it increases ecosystem services over time. Um, and the maintenance needs go way down. And then you can be selective about when and how you maintain the space. Um, and, and let me just check on the time. It's quarter till. Um, I can either, so, so this is a project. It's, it's, it's an amazing small project that has tremendous impact in this suburban community. I can talk about sort of how it's working. Um, or we can sort of move on. I want to talk a little bit about invasive species and then we can, um, an environmental whack-a-mole and we can open up the conversation. Do people have a preference um, between sort of talking about a case study and talking about their own questions? Um, I will just say that because I'm not an expert on some of the unique aspects of Florida coastal habitat, um, I won't be able to speak specifically about sort of dunes and dune plantings, um, retention ponds we can talk about. Uh, okay, I've got to vote for the case study. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with that for the moment. Um, okay. So um, this, is, this is the before picture of the butterfly commons. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, and here we had, a, um, this is a, this is a tiny, there are two sort of tiny strips of grass, of, of grass that you can see on, in this picture, the strip is on the left side of this sidewalk. Um, and the homeowners association was very concerned because, um, stormwater runoff was coming from the houses and the yards, um, and it was flowing right onto the sidewalk and in the winter it was freezing and there was a lot of salting that went on and that salting goes straight into the nearby stream the receiving water and salt is killing off the animals in the stream um, that drains into our potomac river here which is also damaging the potomac river and the chesapeake bay and so on and so forth so you can see the cascading effects that nobody's paying attention to when they're salting the sidewalk. But um, the HOA here wanted something done about the stormwater. They did not want trees or tall shrubs in this area. They wanted a formal landscape. Um, we discussed the stormwater management concerns and how to get an eco-functioning space into this area with those constraints. And part of the point of me saying that is that even with aesthetic concerns and various constraints about not wanting certain plants or certain height plants, you can still draw, you can still create the drivers of ecosystem health. So, oh, first let me, so part of how we did, part of what we did first, because the goal, one of the goals was to remove all the grass. Um, now, turf grass, can be, uh, turf grass removal can be very time energy uh, intensive and expensive if you, if you create, you, you get these machines that can strip it out. But we decided to do something that was a lot more low energy and easy to replicate, which is to smother it. So right before the heat of last summer, um, we, we placed cardboard strips over the grass and then we mulched on top of it. So basically it baked for the summer months and killed off all the grass and its seeds and everything else so that we could start over. Um, and underneath the soil, the, so here's part of what happens with grass. Grass has tiny little roots. So, and as we talked about, deep roots or, or, or large expansive root systems are part of what create porosity in the soil and porosity in the soil is part of what allows water to sink through, right? The water can get through by those holes that are created by the roots and the microbial activity. Well, this soil was completely dead. It was smushed like almost all urban development because that's what construction contractors do. They compact the soil 
they strip off the top layer and compact the soil so that you have a strong foundation and they can run their tractors over it. Um, so the soil under here was largely dead, um, compacted. And then the great thing about grass is it's cheap to lay down. And the roots are so small that you can put it literally like a carpet on top of dead soil. And it'll be pretty much fine. And then those teeny tiny little roots will get what they need from sort of the top edge of the soil. And then it will stay largely dead and compacted beneath that. So anyway, the point here was to get, get it clear of the grass so that we could get native plants with deep root systems in there to start improving the soil and bringing back life below, below the ground. Um, so we did the planting. And one thing I just want to, so, so once we got the plants back in there, and I'll just show you the design. Um, the, the point is here, for as small as this space is, we got vertical structure, plant diversity. There's already improved stormwater management, even, even while those plants are babies. We've got plants that are designed to support biodiversity. We've got carbon sequestration, and we've got nutrient cycle, cycling. All that wasn't happening before. Um, this is a quote from Doug Talmy. I'm just going to skip it for right now for, for time. Uh, oh, shoot. I must have hid the design. Um, OK, I hid the design slide. <laughs> but the point of the design was, um, actually, let's just talk about it during maintenance. Um, um, Let's talk about maintenance for a sec because design and maintenance need to go hand in hand. Um, oftentimes, designers don't consider long-term use and maintenance. Usually, designers are looking at how can I make the place as pretty as possible and give the person the color and the flowers that they like and so on and so forth in landscapes. Um, even when they do consider maintenance, though, too often people strip out the drivers of ecosystem function for the sake of what they think of as easy maintenance, like mowing the grass is easy, when we should be going the other way. Designing for easy maintenance means expanding nature's role rather than reducing it. So um, I'm going to just quickly skip. Um, so designing for minimal maintenance, which usually is what people want, um, means you design for maximum ecosystem function. So you you promote natural succession you use plant native plant density and diversity basically as you reconstruct com plant communities where the plants complement each other and fill in niches you make it harder for weeds general weeds and you make it harder for invasive species which we're going to talk about and then you enable predator controls so in other words partnering with nature lets nature do a lot of the work for us that we've been taking on ourselves because we don't we don't want to do it the way nature does it um uh yeah let me just i just i do want to caution the one the one thing about maintenance and partnering with nature is that um these landscapes are a little bit like babies right they're like having babies in the sense that early on they do require, oftentimes they require extra care, extra care than say throwing down a layer of sod. Once they're established and they're growing and they've created the ecosystem cycles that need to happen, that's when maintenance goes way down. Um, so I, I do, you know, some people get, get a little upset or excited about how hard it is the first year. Um, oh, here's my, here's the design. Uh, here's the design of of the of the strips, the strip components. Um, so we put in native shrubs, which was the woodiest plant we could get in there since we couldn't have trees. Then we put a series of mid-level perennials and then a series of ground level perennials that spread. So as they grow, they fill in. And so you can see from this diagram, there's almost no space. As the plants fill in, you don't need to mulch. There's no mulching needed because they're, they're, as, as they um, 
drop their leaves or do what they do, those nutrients are starting to enrich the soil. And mulch, you don't need a weed suppressant because the plants are already there doing their job. There's no room for weeds, basically. So this is part of the strategy for planting um, yards that function like ecosystems. And I'll just say for invasives, invasives are something that humans have introduced into these ecosystems. Um, invasive plants have almost no known predators. They reproduce wildly. They usually have longer growing seasons than the natives. They're very difficult for a, na for a native ecosystem to fight off. So they are the one kind of plant, these are invasives for Maryland, um, that do require human intervention. That's the one place you want to insert yourself um, for maintenance. That's if, if you're going to take your resources and energy and put them somewhere, put them into invasive removal. And generally, if you do frequent removals, you can weaken them. And as the native plants densify and take hold, they can, they can ward off um, the invasives for the most part. So I'm just going to... We're almost time. Um, let me just tell you what I call the whack-a-mole problem, and then we'll we'll open it up. Um, so what I call the whack-a-mole problem is when we ignore our role within the larger system, when we introduce imbalances into the system, we usually wind up playing environmental whack-a-mole. That means benefiting some particular aspect of the system to the detriment of another. Whack-a-mole happens when economic development, growth, and planning agencies are not working hand-in-hand -hand with environmental protection and natural resource preservation agencies. Whack-a-mole happens just as often within environmental agencies and, and advocacy communities as it does outside of it. So when we hack down forests in the name of new walkable neighborhoods, that's whack-a-mole. Or when we pave over huge amounts of natural space and put up buildings that run on wind and solar energy, that's whack-a-mole. When we focus only on new installations and we fail to maintain our native landscapes, or when we focus only on preserving native landscapes and not restoring other landscapes or adding new ones, all of that is really whack-a-mole. It keeps us running in place. Um, so it's something that I think of all the issues environmentalists need to care about, it's probably the most important. Um, we have a lot of climate change activists historically and even today who focus so heavily on reducing emissions through bicycle modalities, um, you know, and whatnot that they're perfectly willing to cut down forests, to destroy nature, to do whatever they have to do to put that pavement down so people can get on their bikes and ride to work. That is not going to get us where we need to go in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and so I always urge people to constantly look at the big picture, look at system interactions, and try to avoid advocating for policies they're keeping us running in place instead of running forward. Um, and I'll just stop there and stop share. Let me just, um, I can send these slides out since we're out of time, sort of things that if you wanna advocate for public policies that can really be helpful in this effort, um, I'd be happy to send this out and discuss it with anybody in advance, offline, um, and the key takeaways.